what you've been seeing up on the screen as, as you've been eating and having your meeting is the, the start of that seaweed salad. These are uh, kelp zoospores. Kelp spores like a mushroom, but they're zoospores. They move, they have two flagella. And these are about five micron in diameter. They're, they're magnified about 500 times right there. And they're on a grid on a microscope slide uh, because we use that, that's a hemocytometer, we use that to, to uh, calculate or at least estimate the number of spores we have per milliliter. And that's important when we go to create the sporophytes or the small baby kelp plants in our nursery when we start to farm. And the first time I saw this happen, I was amazed because I'm not a scientist, I'm a lay person. And uh, we released these spores from a piece of sugar kelp and uh, we started to say bad words because I used to be a mussel farmer. And when you saw this activity under a microscope, you were really pleased because you had mussel larvae there. And I thought, my word, here we are in our first attempt and we've contaminated our water already. We have all sorts of mussel larvae in it. And, uh, and no, lo and behold, those are kelp zoospores. And I said to my daughter, it was a revelation. It was like watching an acorn fall out of a tree, hit the ground, sprout legs, and run down the street. Because we tend to think of seaweed as a plant, and it really isn't. It, it, it really bridges between plants as we traditionally know them and animals. It's an algae. It's a macroalgae. So there are micro and macroalgae. Seaweed is a macroalgae, and kelp is in the brown family of seaweeds, one of the, the largest of the, the organisms. But it starts out incredibly small. So that was a that that uh, took place. Uh, this video was uh, made in 2010, and it was the first time that we ever uh, saw this happen. Now people have seen this happen all over the world. It was the first time we saw it happen uh, here in Maine. If you've eaten, this makes me seasick. Uh, so we're just going to see just a very little bit of it. Uh, turn away. Uh, I won't have it on for long, but it illustrates a point. We're going out to visit the kelp farm. Um, and the reason I like this video is because in a very short video clip, it's going to illustrate quite a lot about kelp farming. So I'm going to wait just a, a second here. And I'm going to let the boat turn just a little. And I'm going to freeze it so we don't have to worry about dinner. And I'm going to freeze it right there. That's a kelp farm. And this is why I, I like this video. Uh, it, it should, there's, you notice the ground is white. Um, unlike traditional land-based farmers that aren't in greenhouses, we are kind of seasonal. We farm over the winter. Kelp has evolved over the millennia to be a, a organism that likes low light and fairly low temperatures. In fact, we're at the southern end of its range for habitat goes up to the underneath the ice cap and then over to Europe and uh, really likes the cold water and low light. Uh, so winter is our time for activity. And uh, the kelp farm you're seeing right there generates 100,000 pounds of nutritious food product a year. And yet the visual impact is, is very low. It's below the water. It sits seven feet below the water. And when, after we harvest, the kelp farm gets rolled up and it's out of the water. So at times when uh, the bay is really busy with recreational boaters and fishermen and everything else that goes along in the bays, uh, we're not there typically. Um, we'll see people on the margins of, of when we work. But for the most part, uh, it's fairly solitary out there, which actually is, is really nice. Um, and so, and, and you can't see it because I, I uh, paused it at the wrong point, but in the bow of the boat there, we have a number of pieces of equipment where we're testing water quality, and I'll speak to that uh, in a little bit as to, as to why we do that and what we find. So this talk is about the emergence of uh, kelp farming in the, in the U.S. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the other places that farm kelp, but in general, I'm gonna, I, I want to start off talking about aquaculture. So Aquaculture in Maine, uh, 
is, is a very vibrant uh, industry, though we don't hear a lot about it. Uh, marine aquaculture uh, in the U.S., Maine is the largest producer of all 50 states. And the amount of space that aquaculture takes up in, along the coast of Maine can fit inside the runways of the Portland jet port. So it takes up a very little space. We have 3.5 million acres of water in our coastal environment, depending on whether it's high tide or low tide, uh, so give or take. And that, um, that acreage that fits inside those runways generates, on a good year, $120 million to the farmer. And if you compare that to our, uh, our iconic uh, coastal industry, the lobster industry, which I think last year generated about $480 million, uh, in the jet port, we're about a fourth of the size of the lobster industry. And so what that shows you is it's a highly efficient way to grow food. And when aquaculture started in Maine way back uh, when I had hair and it wasn't gray, um, <laughs> it got a black eye. The salmon farms weren't, weren't managed very well. And uh, some of them were an ecological disaster. Uh, it's because we didn't have appropriate regulations in place. It was a new industry. And if you think of where capital goes, capital flows to where the least regulated environment is because it's the cheapest place to do business. And that's, where the cap that's why the capital came into Maine. Uh, some of those salmon farms were funded by uh, overseas uh, individuals and companies because they knew that that was a good place to go in at the time. Unfortunately, we got quite a black eye in aquaculture as a result. Time is, times have changed tremendously and the practices have changed and uh, they're very sustainable uh, industries now and we have a very uh, good company that's running the salmon farms uh, down east and uh, and along with salmon has come mussel farming and uh, oyster farming. Mussel farming is, is, a, is an interesting little business here in Maine. They're, they're farmed on 40 by 40 foot rafts. You may have seen some in Casco Bay or the other places along the coast. Um, we, we produce a million pounds of mussels on our mussel farms in the coast of Maine and uh, there are five, five or six folks that are doing it. Prince Edward Island, that has a fifth of our coastline, produces 44 million pounds of mussels. Uh, and they also, uh, they have a fifth of the coastline, they produce about a fifth of the lobster harvest too. So they figured it out. They figured out how to, how to really balance uh, what sometimes can be conflicting interests of the existing use fisheries and the mussel farms. I was in, uh, Los Angeles uh, just before Thanksgiving, uh, speaking with some customers and went into, I always go to the fish market and see what's being offered. Uh, Prince Edward Island mussels for $12 a pound in Los Angeles. And I asked the fishmonger, I said, you know, why aren't you serving Maine mussels? And I knew the answer and it was because you can't, you can't get any. When I was a mussel farmer, we sold every mussel that we produced before it was born. And we sold it for the price that we asked for. It's really an interesting opportunity for Maine and I think as time goes on we're going to see more of the mussel farming go along. I like mussel farming because mussels are filter feeders and when we would stand in the middle of our 40 foot by 40 foot cames raft that would have a hundred thousand pounds of mussels on it, they'd be on lines going down 40 feet, you could stand in the middle of it in the summer in the middle of Casco Bay and you could see down almost 30 feet because of those millions and millions of mussels that were filtering out. Mussels give off, they, 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 they filter out organic nitrogen and they give off inorganic nitrogen, ammonia. That's what this stuff needs. So I'm moving down the, the food chain. Uh, and so kelp uh, provides a really important ecological service, all the seaweeds do, for our uh, bays and estuaries in that they take up some of the excess nutrients that we sometimes uh, have too much of. Uh, in our bays because of our practices on land. So when I looked at seaweed farming, I thought, you know, this is crazy. Who in the world would ever farm seaweed? Lo and behold, most of the world does. Uh, every country, all continents except for Antarctica have seaweed farms. When we started our seaweed farms back in 2010, uh, the U.S. became the 29th country in the world to farm seaweed, the third country in North America after Mexico and Canada. And it's as diverse as uh, Brazil, which I never would have thought of, Madagascar and South Africa, and Russia. I tended to think of seaweed as being an Asian dish, but it's not. It's a cold water climate dish. And when I 
when, when I look back at my own family's history, which is out of Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island, uh, they ate a lot of seaweed back then. It was because Clarence Birdseye hadn't come along with the frozen pea, and uh, great grandma Clements would wait out there and grab some kelp off the rock and throw it in whatever stew she was cooking in the middle of the winter because that's how you got your green vegetable nutrition. And if you look at uh, accounts of what the Native Americans were eating uh, way back when, they would eat seaweed for the same purpose. And it's like that in all of these societies. Uh, they, were, they were eating the seaweeds to get that nutrition that they couldn't get in any other way uh, at certain times of the year. And I'm sure when Clarence Birdseye came along with the frozen peas that that outpoured up in Newfoundland and, you know, great-great-grandma Clements said to great-great-grandpa Clements, that's it, I'm not going into the water anymore, we're eating peas. And we lost that tradition. Uh, we lost that tradition uh, in, in the U.S. Some societies have not lost it, uh, principally the Asian societies. Uh, World War II, up until the advent of Burger King and Kentucky Fried in Japan, 11% of their caloric intake was seaweed. Uh, and I say it's been going on for a long time. Three years ago, uh, off the coast of Ireland in a mud flat, they found a, archaeologists found a 400-year-old seaweed farm. So what we tend to think of as Asian really is, think of it as a, a global uh, enterprise. So it's all continents. It's the largest uh, by weight and volume marine aquaculture crop globally, representing 40% of all of the weight taken out of the ocean through aquaculture. Uh, it was, last year's harvest was about 26.3 million metric tons, almost all of it for human consumption. Um, and our demand for seaweed, which is about $300 million a year to the farmer uh, in the U.S., is almost entirely uh, made up of Asian imports. And so when we look at this, we say, boy, there, there might be an opportunity here for us on the coast of Maine. Uh, I mentioned it performs important ecological services. In its mature phase, this macroalgae that sits between an animal and a plant functions very much like a plant using photosynthesis to generate the energy it requires to grow and live. And so in that process, it's absorbing excess CO2 in the ocean, phosphorus, nitrogen, and it's giving off oxygen. It's a great, great organism in terms of its ecological services that provides. The nitrogen that it's taking in is principally ammonia. And we see the results of this in our nursery where when we're growing up our little kelps from spores into something that's just, just at the verge of being not microscopic, um, we will see the uh, pH of our water changed dramatically during the day as it goes through photosynthesis because what it's doing is it's absorbing that CO2 and the water is going base, the opposite of ocean acidification. And so this is a, you know, this, this plant is uh, the bays and estuaries friends. It's very important to our ecosystem. And our company name is Ocean Approved. When I was younger, I was a scallop diver. I hated those urchins. They were everywhere. I had spines in me. There were billions of them. And I got out of the water for 25 years, and I came back, and I went down into the water, and I burned a tank, no urchins, burned another tank, no urchins, third tank, you know, about the size of a silver dollar, and I was stunned. So our company name, Ocean Approved, is our two-word mission statement. We're only going to do things that the best science and our experience on the water would tell us is the right thing to do uh, for the ocean. And so moving into farming this is the mm -hmm. right thing to do. We started our company with wild harvest. We still do some wild harvest. We're reliant on it to fill our demand. But last year, we had 51% of our production come from our farms. Because kelp is so important to the environment going into those kelp beds. I don't want to see what happened to the urchins and the scallops and the shrimp and the cod and everything else happen to the kelp, because it's too important to the environment. So uh, someone asked where our farms are. We're about, because we're next to Shabig, we're about six miles uh, from Portland. Some of the parameters that we check, we use a SETG disk. We want to look at turbidity. We uh, record turbidity every week, salinity, uh, the nitrogen content in the water, and we match that with the nitrogen uptake of the plants. And we're looking at water temperature. Temperature is really important for farming. 
what's interesting about our environment is that we have extension agents for farmers and they'll go and you can get a soil tested and you know what to put into the soil. We live in such a dynamic environment. One, we, we can't add anything to our environment, uh, though the Chinese do in their base. We're, we're never going to be there. Um, but we're trying to figure out you know, where to place these kelp farms uh, so that they'll, they'll absolutely grow the best. And we see even a dramatic difference between our farm off of Shabig and our farm off of Little Shabig in terms of growth rates. And so because we're in a nascent industry, we try to collect as much data as we can so that hopefully 10, 15 years from now, we'll be able to look at that data or someone will be able to look at that data and say, aha, okay, the best place to place these farms is here. This is what they're doing in terms of ecological services. This is how the, the kelp is growing. And they really start to develop a body of knowledge that's going to help the next generation of seaweed farmers. Um, this is Dr. Susie Arnold, who is somewhere in the room here. Susie? Susie? There, Susie. And maybe you could explain what this contraption is that's about to go overboard last week. Sure. Um, so there's two instruments in that stainless steel cage. The one that's um, further to the water um, is called a SAMI CO2 sensor. Basically, it's a sophisticated carbon dioxide sensor that measures changes in carbon dioxide in the water. And a larger instrument that's closer to, to us on the screen is called a CFOX. And that's a sophisticated pH sensor. It also measures dissolved oxygen and salinity. It can measure temperature. Um, so basically, we paired those two instruments to get at the two critical parameters that allow us to tell whether this kelp farm is ameliorating ocean acidification. So it's important to be able to measure not just pH, but pair it with another um, parameter of car carbonate chemistry. So in this case, we're measuring pH and carbon dioxide. And so we can really, we'll, we'll be able to tell if, as the kelp grows, it is improving the water chemistry around it. So this is, uh, Susie's with the Island Institute. And uh, we, we're, we're thrilled that they're, they're uh, putting this stuff onto our farm, because again, it, it, it'll allow us to have a little better understanding of what we're doing, because we, we really don't know what we're doing. Uh, you know, we. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> We're really making it up as we uh, go along um, uh, because we, this is our, uh, we're going into our seventh season, which sounds like a long time, but if you think of how long we've been growing wheat as a civilization, uh, the, what we understand about this is really the very, very tip of the iceberg, uh, which makes it fun. You know, we, we learn stuff uh, every week. Uh, sometimes we're not happy about what we learn, but uh, we learn stuff every week. So, so how does this start? What we do is we take a mature piece of, we're talking about churn kelp, they're the long bands, and if you're walking along the beach and you find one, lift it up and hold it to the light, and you'll see that it's mostly translucent, except for down at the end, not near the, the stalk or the stipe, but down at the, the end of it, you'll see an opaque area, and that's called the sorus tissue, and the sorus tissue contains those spores. Um, if you were to rub your fingers along it, it's going to feel raised up from the kelp. And the reason it feels raised up is there are tubes, actually, that are microscopic tubes that are sticking out perpendicular to the kelp. Those are called sporangia, and each one holds 32 spores. What we do, and you can do this at home, is take a piece of that uh, sorus tissue, about 2 inches by 4 inches, put it between some paper towels and stick it in the fridge for a couple nights. Take it out, put it in a jelly jar of seawater that's at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and you should see that jar turn this color. And what those are, those are spores. So what Sarah here is doing is she's looking at that microscope slide we saw at the very beginning, and she's estimating the number of spores per milliliter. This is a liter of seawater. And in that, in this particular liter, there are about 9.6 billion spores. So uh, these kelp, they can reproduce like there's no tomorrow. And uh, what she's going to do is take some of this uh, water that has spores in it, and she's going to inoculate these tubes in our nursery. And in this tube is a smaller tube. And everything we do is, is really, we try to low tech. The only high tech thing we have is our, our microscope. Everything else comes out of Petco's, like a Walmart typey store, a Home Depot typey store, and you know, our home base, Hamilton Marine. 
and that's it. It's very, very low, uh, low tech stuff. So what she's going to do is she's going to put some of these spores, the calculated amount, into these tubes that are filled with salt water. And in it is this small tube here that's wound with kite string. You can see the diameter right there. And the spores are going to swim over and they're going to attach to it. And that'll happen within 24 hours. If it doesn't happen within about 24 hours, they're going to fall to the bottom and they're going to die because they run out of lipids, which is their energy source when they're in this phase of their life. And so uh, they, after 24 hours, we pull it out of this tube and then we take and we put it into the aquarium and these things are off and running. And they'll spend about 35 days uh, in that aquarium and they'll go through, uh, they'll form gametophytes. So uh, these are some gametophytes here. This one that looks like a scorpion and rather robust. This is a female and she has an egg right here. Uh, these rather scrawny things without much to them. Uh, they're males and they have a sperm. There's one right there and they're going to reproduce and they'll form a kelp sporophyte. And here's a uh, eight day old kelp, uh, sugar kelp plant sporophyte that has eight cells and it's on this string that's magnified to give you a, uh, an idea of what size it is. It already has some color to it. It's photosynthesizing and producing its energy uh, in, that, in that manner. And it's going to grow uh, rather quickly. So it's growing on these spools here. You can see there's different density. When we first went out, we had no idea what density to put these at. We now uh, um, inoculate, if you will, at 10,000 spores per milliliter of water in that green tube, and it gives us a nice uh, even coating. Now, these have been in the tank for a long time. When we're actually in production, we take these out of the tank, and this will have kind of a brown sheen. They're still microscopic, or just at the verge of microscopic, but there's enough of them, so it colors the string. Uh, what is a long time? Months, weeks? This has probably been in there for 45 days. So we typically will take them out, of the ocean, out to the ocean in 30 days. And while we're in the nursery, we're concerned about other uh, species coming into the tank. And we're also, and that would come in when we do water changes or some kind of contamination. We come in off the boat, stick our hand in the water. So we try to practice good laboratory practices. And we're very concerned with the pH. And what we'll find is towards the end, particularly if it looks like this, um, we went down to the beer distributor and got a CO2 cylinder and a regulator. And at the end of the day, we have to actually put CO2 into the tanks to bring that base down so that, you know, it's almost like the kelp trying to commit suicide by doing too much photosynthesis. So uh, we, we have to be very careful at about day 26 to day 30 uh, that the stuff doesn't go too far base and, and destroy itself. So after about day 30, they're ready to go out in the open ocean. They go back into this uh, tube again for transport out to the farm site. And then we, uh, we seed out the lines. So uh, this is a kelp line. This is off of the Little Shabig farm. These lines are 1,500 feet long. Uh, and they're going to reside seven feet below the surface. And you can just see this spiraling out. We actually let this kelp uh, grow out fairly large here so that you could see it in the picture. Typically, you wouldn't be able to see it when we're seeding. Uh, this is New Year's Day. This is uh, traditionally our last day of seeding. Uh, we start seeding at the end of October, middle of November, depending on water temperature. And then we stagger our seedings up through uh, December so that we have an opportunity to at least somewhat stagger our harvest so that we don't get inundated with all of our kelp uh, right away. The, the, most in, the highest tech piece of equipment we have in our, in our arsenal is this, uh, what it amounts to about 17 cents worth of PVC tube. Uh, that's purchased at the hardware store. When we were trying to figure out how we were going to get the seed string or the seed out onto the farm, uh, we were working with a, a, a number of uh, highly talented academics uh, with uh, outrageous budgets. Um, and uh, boy, we had all kinds of ideas, mechanical arms going like this and you know, big machines and hydraulics. And we said, you know, on the water, the simpler the better. And so we got onto YouTube and uh, someone in Spain had figured this out. So we're going to practice this right now. We're going to see how it's going to work. The question, how do we get it on there? So I'm going to need some volunteers. And if you've been in the service, you'll know what happens if no one volunteers. 
because someone's going to volunteer. <laughs> okay, Ed, you're going to be a mooring. All right. I need another mooring. Anyone want to bond? Uh, all right, and what's your name? Jeanette. Jeanette is going to be another mooring. Now, they're fairly low-skilled tasks. The next one is a high-skilled task. I need someone to be a motorboat, and they have to be able to make the motorboat sound. <laughs> all right, I need one motorboat. I'll be a motorboat. Okay, and you're? Kathleen is going to be the motorboat. Okay, see there's kind of a uh, aisle there. We're going to just kind of move away from that a little bit. This is the line that we use for our kelp farms. It's just polypropylene line. And we're going to run this down. And when we make our kelp farms, we actually uh, run the line off of reels right as we're seeding. So we build the farm every year, and then when we harvest, we take the farm out. Uh, so for this demonstration, though, we're going to pretend the farm is, is already in the water. So uh, you're going to be a mooring at this end. Yeah. All right. It's, it's rough out there, so hold fast. All right, and my other mooring. You're going to be a mooring, and you're going to go over to that beam down there. And Karen, uh, the farm may go right through you, so we may have to ask you to move. But come summer, you can move right back to where you were. All right. So we're going to ho hold this up. So this is our long line. Now, uh, Kath M motor vessel Kathleen, come on over. And the MB Kathleen, the MB Kathleen <laughs> is, uh, has the seed spool on it. And you'll notice it has two rubber bands, one at each end. What we're going to do is we're going to take this line off of the mooring, all the way off of the mooring. Okay. Yeah. There we go, and then we're going to pull the line tight again and lift it up, pretend it's floating in the water. And then we're going to take one of the rubber bands off. Mm, the high tech part. This is the high tech part. And then we're going to tie it, and you're just going to hold it with your finger like we tie it. Now, I'm going to be a motorboat. you ready for the motorboat sound? Yep. Okay, so you want to put your thumb right there to just keep a little tension on it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> She's running on biodiesel. And this is how we do it, and that's about the speed we do it. It takes about 20 minutes to uh, seed out about 1,000 feet of line. Each tube takes 200 feet of string, and so we put five tubes on a 1,000-foot line. Now, what happens is when we come up to the end of that, we'll cut it, we'll cut the line, we'll take the tube off, we'll put a new tube on, splice the line together, and then just keep going down. Now, that sounds rather complicated, but when you've had a crew of two that have been working together for a while, there's no need to talk. It just happens, and, and away you go. You go right down the, down the line. So we can set this on the floor now. So then the next step will be we lower it down uh, seven feet, and we have buoys that will keep it at that. We put a buoy about every 200 feet. Thank you very much, Motorboat. Thank you very much, Maureen. Excellent job. And we have, at the beginning, we'll have those buoys that suspended at about seven feet. As the season goes on, we actually have to put weights on the line because the line is going to want to float up. And the reason being is that uh, the, the components of a, of a sugar kelp plant are the hold fast. That's what we see clinging to the rocks. I tell kids it's analogous to tree roots. However, the function isn't to absorb nutrients. It's just really what its name suggests, is to hold fast onto something. Then it has its stalk or its trunk, which is called a stipe, and then the frond. In sugar kelp, as it matures, that stipe fills with gas. And that's to lift that frond up off of the bottom so that it can absorb nutrients efficiently on both sides of the frond and it's not laying down in the mud. And so typically if you're diving, you'll see the hold fast and then the stipe will come up and then the frond will be off in the current depending on which way the current's going. And as a result of all of that gas in those stipes is that the lime will start to rise up. And it could be that on a thousand foot piece of line, we might have to put two to three hundred pounds of weight just to hold it down at the seven foot level if those stipes are really taking off. Now we can, uh, we can uh, predict and uh, determine how much stipe we have in a plant because it's based on the mom. So the mom controls the stipe. And so what we can do is make sure that we're getting uh, fronds from small stipe plants, and then we can separate these out. And we do that, we actually can keep them in stasis under red light. 
forever. We can grow them up and we can have a nice stock of, or a nice uh, cohort of small stipe moms. Uh, it could be though that we want long stipes for uh, particular products and we can also do that. We can go after uh, long stipe moms when we're going to get the spores to seed. So, Are they always growing up towards the sun? They're always growing up, yep. Uh, well, the stipes will grow up, but the, the plant underwater, everyone says, well, they, they hang down and touch the bottom. The fronds are actually neutral. They're 90% water, and they're going off uh, parallel to the surface of the water uh, because the current is going on either side of them. So this is what a farm looks like when it's seeded out. These are the buoys that are holding the lines up uh, at seven feet. Seven feet, we did a study where we dropped 100 lines down 40 feet from one of our mussel rafts. And we looked at the growth over the season. We just overlaid all the curves and it came that seven feet was about the best average place for growth. And it works out well because where we are in the bay, uh, there are only a couple boats that have more than seven foot draft. And if they're in our kelp farm, they have much bigger problems than um, uh, than our kelp farm. They need to be on the horn to their insurance agent pretty quick because they're about to run aground. And uh, so we uh, were very pleased that it's not a hazard to navigation. We've had Hinkley's go through it while we're harvesting. That was rather unnerving. Um, power of boats, many folks, it's, it's stunning. But you know, you see something like this, you'd say, boy, maybe something interesting is going on there. Most people are, I want to get from A to B and away they go. Uh, No, we, at, when we were mussel farmers, we did. Uh, but what we found is that it, at the time, it was too difficult to manage both businesses at once. So we ended up selling our mussel farm to Matt Moretti, uh, who was a young kid at the time, 26 years old, and he's done a fabulous job with it. You know, the next generation coming up, and he's, he's doing an excellent job. So uh, that's the farm. And uh, so we, har we, we seeded on January 1st. This is April 1st, and we're ready to harvest. And the kelp that was about microscopic, typically when it goes down. Uh, 90 days later, it's, these fronds are going to be up to 20 feet in length. And so uh, we're able to uh, generate about 30,000 pounds of food per acre, which is about what you generate out of a potato field. Uh, however, we do it without any arable land, fresh water, fertilizers, and pesticides. There's no inputs other than labor, which is something that we need more opportunity for on the coast in the winter. We have three full-time employees and we have 32 part-time seasonal employees. So like every farming business, we have our very, very busy season and then our season which is not so busy. And so we bring people on. Um, and our nursery is located at Southern Maine Community College. We have a very wonderful relationship with them. And uh, we use uh, space in their wet lab for our nursery in the fall when we need seed. And then they run a marine botany course in the spring and they use our equipment and they grow up kelp sporlings. And then we get to hire those kids. Uh, it really works out well. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a great collaborative relationship. We, we love SMCC. They're our, they're our lifeblood. Um, it's all fun and well to grow this stuff. And I really enjoy it. And it's amazing to see this stuff come out of the water every year. But you have to be able to sell it. And so we actually started out the company doing product concepts and product development because unless you have an outlet for it, um, you know, all that fun is for not, you, you're not going to be able to sell it. We compete against Asian imports and we have a higher uh, cost of living here in Maine. We have higher energy costs. We have um, a, a, a cost structure that, that, you know, the Chinese can only shake their head at and compared to what they have. And so we had to develop products that could command a premium price in the marketplace and be more appealing uh, to the American consumer than the Asian imports. We don't sell retail. We sell into institutions. And one of our customer segments is the smoothie market. So we have a product called the Smoothie Cube, which is kelp from our farm that's macerated and is frozen into a half ounce cube. And it contains all the iodine you need for a day. And Iodine is a very uh, difficult nutrient to come across for us in our modern diet. So, uh, and, and the evidence of that is, um, you know, you got when it rains, it pours, and the pouring out, what else does it say on that can? Iodized. 1924, 
the U.S. government realized that we as a country were going iodine deficient. And they said, all right, what's the one thing all Americans eat and eat a lot of? Salt. So they went to the salt companies and say, said, thou shalt iodize. And that's how we ended up with iodized salt. The reason that they had to do that was by 1924, our, our modern, at the time, farming practices, um, iodine's a trace element. It had been taken out of the soil. So it had been, it had been you know, used by the plants and then extracted from the field when it was harvested, and then we consumed it, and then the next year the farmer would go and fertilize, but fertilizers don't contain iodine. And so over the course of you know, decades, all that iodine was out, and there wasn't any iodine in the, in the, the vegetables anymore. And so kelp, kelp is a bioaccumulator. And all that iodine just didn't disappear. Where does everything end up? In the sea. And so uh, the, the kelp on our farm, uh, a two ounce or a half ounce, a half ounce portion there is 105% of your daily uh, iodine requirement. To get the same amount from the best terrestrial source, you drink 24 ounces of milk a day. And one of the things that's happening in our society is, what are our doctors telling us about salt? Right? Don't, don't, don't eat as much salt. And what are we starting to purchase? We're starting to purchase sea salt. And saying, well, perfect. It's got to have a lot of iodine. It doesn't have any iodine in it, right? Because sea salt isn't a bioaccumulator of iodine, you know? Kelp is. Um, and so we're eating less salt. We're eating less iodized salt. We're eating more processed foods. And process, food processing companies do not use iodized salt because the iodine changes the flavor profile of the product. So even though we're eating more processed foods with a lot of salt in them, we're not getting uh, that iodine. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics, about three years ago now, came up with a policy statement. They very rarely put out a policy statement. And the policy statement said, hey, guess what? Basically, we're going iodine deficient again. It's the early stages of it, but it's something that we want to uh, be aware of. And oh, by the way, you expectant moms out there, those iodine supplements you're taking in the horse pills that the guy gives you, um, it's not bioavailable. It's passing right through you. So make sure you're drinking milk or you're you know, having seafood that has iodine in it because it's important for the cognitive development of your baby. And so the smoothie companies, uh, you know, kale is a superfood, and everyone's putting kale in the smoothies. Kale doesn't have any iodine in it. In fact, nothing that's going into the smoothie has any iodine in it. So we have a very nice market with institutional smoothie companies um, for this product here, and it allows us, it's something that the uh, Asian uh, uh, companies don't have yet and may not have because they don't do a frozen product. All of their stuff is dried or dried and then reconstituted. So we think we have a, a leg up. We also have a very nice competitive advantage in being at the Gulf of Maine. So this is a imported uh, seaweed salad from a, a store called Wegmans. Uh, they're a chain that's kind of in the New York area, Western Mass. Very nice store. Um, this, is, this is the seaweed salad. It has blue dye one and yellow dye five. And almost every seaweed salad coming out of Asia has this because the seaweed is brought over to here uh, dried and then reconstituted. And when you reconstitute dried kelp, it comes out and looks like that. This is the same seaweed salad without any dyes. And so for the American palate, that's not as appealing. And that's why they put the dyes. In fact, both of these came from Wegmans. They're the exact same seaweed salad. One has dyes and one doesn't. Um, they wanted to have a dye-free salad, and they discontinued it because no one bought it. This is uh, seaweed from the Gulf of Maine. So it's kelp, brown kelp. Now everyone says, well, why is it green? It's been blanched and then frozen. And so when we think of the opportunity for Maine, we believe American consumers would prefer something local where they know where it came from, doesn't have the dyes, and is a little more visually appealing. Seaweed's a bioaccumulator of heavy metals. And it's a bioaccumulator of radiation. And we actually, because uh, many of our customers are uh, hospitals, a segment of ours is the retail dining side of hospitals, uh, schools, Bowdoin uh, uh, purchases our products. They're very concerned about things like heavy metals and radiation. We actually had our, <laughs> they're concerned about radiation too. <laughs> 
Uh, we actually had our seaweed tested up at the University of Maine, and um, uh, don't want to cast any dispersions on any nuclear physicist in the audience, but if you ever have an opportunity to speak to a nuclear physicist, um, you come away kind of glum. Uh, so the good news was we don't have any Fukushima radiation in our seaweed, as we suspected that we wouldn't. Though there is a significant challenge over in Asia, the 2014 Korean harvest, 14% um, uh, of that Korean harvest was contaminated with radiation. Uh, that was reported by the Korean news agency. They didn't say who got that. They just said it was contaminated. So you can imagine where it went. Um, uh, but I did find out from the physicist at, uh, at UMaine that really that ra radiation from all of the nuclear blasts, if we went out and took a teaspoon of uh, dirt from the garden here and went in, he could, he could tell us all the different bomb blasts and when they'd happen because it's everywhere and it's in everyone. Uh, but the good news is we don't have the, the Fukushima radiation. Um, and we don't have any heavy metals in our kelp. So, so far, we've been very fortunate. We don't have any detectable levels of uh, heavy metals in our kelp. I think in part because we're in the water so such a short period of time. Um, it, when you look at an Asian kelp farm, and if you've ever used Google Earth, you can go over to China and about halfway up the coast, get about 5,000 feet off the surface, start to go up the bays, and you'll see these shadows in the bays that pretty much cover the entire bay. Those are the seaweed farms. And they're typically located right next to an industrial city. Um, and so we have a significant advantage here in the Gulf of Maine in that no matter how hard they try, they're going to have, a, they're, they're far behind us in terms of water quality uh, with what we have in our great natural resource. So I think there's a super opportunity for Maine companies. Our brand is wonderful. Our waters are so much cleaner than they are anywhere else. And the consumer perception is, and we went out to California and we asked 3,500 Californians would you consider a kelp or a seaweed from the Gulf of Maine local? And it's never happened to be before in my career. 3,500 people said yes. And the follow-up question was, why? And they said, because it comes from this continent as opposed to overseas. They're more attenuated as to where the seaweed comes from because, you know, we tend to look towards Europe because when we wake up in the morning and look out in the ocean, we're headed towards Europe. They, at, in the evening, when they're watching the sunset, they're looking at Asia. So they're, they're, they, they, they understand what's going on. If you go onto our website and you've decided now, oh my word, I want to be a kelp farmer because it looks so much fun to be out there and uh, <laughs> yeah, in the winter. Uh, at, on our sustainability page, there's a place where you can download everything we know about kelp farming. We decided to open source it so that others could start farms as a means, uh, one, to start the industry going, but also we have an opportunity to purchase kelp off of other farmers so that we're able to grow faster than if we were just doing it off of our farms. And so the Paul Allen Foundation uh, funded, uh, I think it was a million and a half dollars for a uh, kelp farm out in Puget Sound using our technology so that uh, they, they're going to surround um, uh, clam beds because the clam beds are dying because of the ocean acidification. And much as uh, Susie is studying you know, what are the effects of, uh, of a seaweed farm out here, uh, they're, doing, they're doing much the same thing, only on a real big West Coast scale. That particular farm is on the shore side of the Falmouth side of Shabig, uh, just south of Indian Point and just north of Little Shabig, and the, uh, the lines run parallel to the shore. The Little, the little Shabig, which was the first seaweed farm in the U.S., that one's doing better and the growth, and Susie, Susie saw this, we planted it two weeks later and the plants are twice as large right now. Um, I, I believe it is due to uh, about a knot more of current. So you need a certain amount of current. More current, more uh, successful. Yeah, yeah, because the, you know, this stuff can't run to uh, catch its food. It's, it's got to wait for the water to come by it to absorb those nutrients so it, it can feed more efficiently. Mm. We don't like to harvest stuff that's less than 14 feet long. Uh, 28 years ago, sugar kelp grew in New York Harbor, and it doesn't grow there anymore. Uh, it, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't grow in the wild in Long Island Sound. It's this big in, in Rhode Island now, and it's a water temperature issue. So uh, the water temperature is, is warming up, and as a result, we're, we're at the very southern range of this of this organism's uh, habitat. It really does like uh, cold water and, and low sunlight. Further north, is it going to grow like 35 feet or something? Oh, yeah. I was in Cobbscook Bay uh, last week, and, you know, it's, they're like telephone poles.
You know, it's really big. It's really big. So we, we, we happen to be in areas where it's, it's pretty clean. There are parts along the coast, particularly if you go down east around the pink granite where the natural level of arsenic is higher. Um, we, uh, this stuff's only in the water for about uh, 90 days, whereas a mature sugar kelp plant in the wild might be four years old, maybe five years old, and that's about the length of their uh, life cycle. And so we've been, we've been fortunate so far. Sugar yeah, and in fact, we sell, we sell uh, to Brown Trading, we sell actually whole little baby sugar kelp wraps uh, that they sell to a couple of very high-end restaurants. Yeah, you know, um, even our stuff is, is fibers, you know, and I was talking to Bill. Uh, you know, I can't eat a lot of it because it just fills me up. It's got a lot of fiber in it. And an interesting thing about the fiber is that in... Uh, research they did over in the UK uh, with laboratory uh, mice, they fed mice a diet with marine fiber from kelp. So over in the UK, they, the same species of kelps grow. And, uh, and then they fed a, the control group uh, standard uh, fiber. And the experimental group, uh, uh, the, uh, they absorbed 75% less fat when they were eating the marine fiber than they did with the standard fiber. So they replicated the study over in Japan, and now they're in clinical trials. The thought is, if the kids are gonna eat Twinkies, put marine fiber in the Twinkies. Uh, and they're looking at it, the whole basis of their grants from the uh, British uh, health system is as a means to fight childhood obesity. Yeah. The stuff, I'm 109 years old, I eat it every day. <laughs> It's amazing stuff. So it is, so Bill, part of it is we're, we're chopping it up. We blanch it, which tenderizes it. So that's part of it too. And it, and it depends on the type of kelp. So this is sugar kelp, but we grow horsetail, which is really tough. We grow alaria, which is very tender, wing kelp. Uh, and we grow a kelp that's very interesting. It doesn't have a Latin name yet. It uh, was first identified in 1957 and then kind of forgotten. Uh, it was found off the giant uh, steps the giant staircase in Harpswell, and uh, that's the only known place that it grows in the world so far, and they're doing the genetic test to understand is it an environmental morph of sugar kelp or is it a completely new species? And so there, in, in the Gulf of Maine, we have about 230 different species of seaweeds, and so it may be that you know, you've got a, uh, a pretty tough one. Now, people ask me, you know, can I eat kelp that I you know, washes up on the beach. And I said, absolutely, wrap it around that fish that walked, washed up on the beach and chomp away. Uh, so if you're going to eat kelp, uh, you know, just wade out, you know, at least up to your knees and grab it off the rocks there. But there are no poisonous seaweeds in the Gulf of Maine. And in fact, there are only two known uh, recorded deaths from uh, poisonous seaweed. It was in the South Seas in the Pacific on a small island, uh, you know, People came in, the natives said, don't eat that. They ate it and died. Uh, but that's the only uh, known. It actually, I joke that I'm 109 years old. It's, it has a lot of the trace elements and minerals that we're missing from our modern diet, so it's highly nutritious. The fiber is great. Uh, sugar kelp has more calcium than milk, more iron. Uh, the spinach, more fiber than brown rice. The fiber is of a, a good fiber. And then it's packed with these uh, micronutrients that we're we struggle to get in our in our modern diet. But is it is a wild caught kelp going to be very high in mercury, for example, or some of the other? We have tested um, at least in in our neck of the woods. We have tested the wild kelps because we still rely heavily on wild harvest until our farms grow up larger than they are. We have never had a detectable limit of heavy metals in our seaweed, so we've been very fortunate. And we tested two different laboratories so that we're comparing results. Now there is some concern about the methodology that's being used to test because uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is an algae and the methodologies were designed to test it in cabbage and you know is there something different in, uh, in the polysaccharides in kelp that absorb this stuff uh, that we don't know about but as far as we know right now other kelps will show up with heavy metals ours, ours have not so we're, we're very fortunate. We sell it, we sell it. So we, so typically, almost all of our product goes through distribution. We sell it in one pound or 2.2 pound, one kilo bags that are frozen. Excuse me? Dehydrated? Nope, frozen. 
frozen. Processing that. We are. You got your own yeah. So we're, we're principally a food products company that got into aquaculture so that we could secure our supply chain in a sustainable fashion. So we're completely vertically integrated. We take it from those little spores that you see right up to delivering it to the customer. Could we ask what, what's the wholesale on a pound, a pound block? So if you were a wholesaler, you'd, you'd be buying it off of me for $8 a pound. $8 a pound. Yeah. Yeah. And if you went to the Chinese, you could buy it for... 84 cents a pound. Yeah, there's a there's a really large difference. So we um, we that's get the pound. that's a wet pound. We get the we get the cream of the crop on the top of the market. If you've eaten at flatbread pizza, yeah. the kelp on that little sal that little bit of kelp that's our that's our kelp. We got that account three days after Fukushima, because they were using Japanese uh, seaweed sal seaweed, and their customers went to them and said, Hey, wait a minute, you know, is there a domestic alternative to this? And so it shows us that there's really an opportunity for an industry to develop in the Gulf of Maine mm -hmm. um, that can be done in a sustainable fashion that is, you know, provides positive ecological services, provides jobs for folks in the winter, and creates a highly nutritious food source that we know is, is healthy for us in, in many different ways. You know how we have ex ex uh, ag schools? You know, there are 26 ag schools around the country? There are, 20, there are 16 Sea Grant schools around the country that act just like ag schools. And University of Maine is a, is an, is a land grant and a Sea Grant university. And so Sea Grant up there, uh, actually the woman that you saw looking through the microscope, at, so that's Sarah Redman. She's a very interesting young woman. Um, we met her in a bar uh, down, in, down in Portland, uh, our muscle barge captain. Uh, was down in the dumps because his head uh, worker was going to be sick and out for the next day. We had a big harvest. He's sitting next to Sarah and says, you wouldn't happen to work on the water, would you? And she said, yeah, I'm a NOAA fisheries observer on the beach for a couple weeks. And uh, he said, great. Would you like to be out on the muscle raft tomorrow? She said, sure. So word gets back that we have this young woman that can work like crazy and is just wonderful on the water. So I take the skiff out to the muscle barge and I'm shoveling muscle mud with her. And it's like, so what do you want to do in life, Sarah? You seem... You know, you're highly educated. She has a degree in marine science from the University of Maine. She said, I want to be a seaweed farmer. And we we're like, oh we're the people for you. <laughs> so uh, we got her down to the University of Connecticut where she got a master's in seaweed aquaculture. And she got hired by Sea Grant, and she's the country's first seaweed extension agent. And she is growing, uh, working on growing dulls right now so that we could grow it out on our farms Farming. and working through the, the life cycle. Now one of the challenges with growing dulls is the plants are about this big and they take up the same amount of space on your long line. So you're going to get less yield, but one of the opportunities is we may be able to grow it in the summer. So we grow kelp in the winter and dulse in the summer, which would then increase our yields over annual yields on our farm. And I do love that, that taste. And in fact, scientists at the University of Oregon have developed adults that even taste more like bacon than, than our stuff, right? I mean, if you want the kids to eat it, right? Make it taste like bacon. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do we, you know, this is the commons, right? This is all of ours. How come we can do this, right? And someone else couldn't. Well, everyone can if you go through the permitting process. So it, we get, we, on our seaweed farms, we are actually only have two governing bodies, the Army Corps of Engineers, as hazards to navigation, and the Department of Marine Resources mm -hmm. to ensure that we're good stewards of the environment and we're not uh, displacing existing use. Okay. And so that process takes about two years okay. uh, to go through that process. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of uh, data collection on existing use. There's uh, environmental assessments of the bottom. Uh, there's quite a lot of discussion about what you'll be doing on it and how you'll be doing it and when you'll be doing it. And the public has the opportunity to provide input mm -hmm. and be an intervener and say, hey, guess what? This isn't a good idea and here is why. But this is in the winter you're doing it, so not many people are out in the winter, right? No, not many. Not many. But your question to what happens if someone's farming dulse and it's counter seasonal to us, right. we don't even know at this point what the optimum depth is. So it's really early, 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 early days for it. No, it's, it's, it's suspended, so it's always at that, at that level. Because our farms are in about 30 feet of water, so the farm just rides up and down, yeah, with the tide. We, we see that in our farms. So we, one of the, when you're permitting, you want to find a place that isn't used. And so we look for what we call mud holes. 
basically it's a mud flat bottom with no structure to hold any kind of marine life. And uh, so our farm goes into a mud hole where there's nothing in the water column. If I go out to the farm today, even though the farm's only been in the water for two weeks, I can, even if those buoys weren't there, I can tell which way the lines are going just by watching the loons. Because the loons travel uh, parallel to the lines and they're looking down and boom, they go right down and they get, because in that kelp, uh, we'll ha right now we're, we're starting to get pollock, there are little hake, uh, there is all kinds of stuff. And what I want to do, it won't happen this year, but the following year is get a high school student that's interested in marine science um, and have them go out once a week, pull the line up over the, over the skiff and then just shake it and then count everything and, and identify everything that falls out of that. Uh, because it's amazing the biodiversity that happens uh, in that kelp farm in an area where it was really just an empty water column. Uh, and it'd be fun to find out, you know, and kind of quantify what we see uh, there. And I think it'd be a great project for a young, young person. This is, yeah, so how we uh, harvest it is the line gets picked up and we have a small barge and we just run down the line, it's like a clothesline, and someone literally just has a knife and it falls into uh, big insulated fish boxes. Um, but we shake the line as it's coming up and, and things come out. Uh, crabs, it, it's amazing what, what falls out of it. Um, and then we bring it in and yeah, we, uh, we rinse it, uh, then we trim it, and then we cut it, and then we blanch it, and then we chill it, and then we uh, package it weigh it, package it, and we seal it, freeze it, put it in a master carton, and it goes out the door. And that's everything but the hold fast? Itself? Yeah, everything but the hold fast gets used. Um, for the seaweed salad, we send our raw material, if you will, the, um, this, this material here, uh, to a, a co-packer, because we're only licensed as a single ingredient facility, and they put in, the second ingredient in that seaweed salad is honey, and then uh, carrots, uh, shallots, um, what else goes in there? Ginger, sesame seeds, and sesame oil. And then some spices, uh, red pepper flakes. So, and then the last thing we do, we bring the lines in, and we roll them out in our yard, and now we have that little string that's wrapped around it. So there are five families that uh, uh, come together that, that own Ocean Approved. We all have children, and the children, uh, we, have, we put out 30,000 feet of line, and uh, they spend the first couple of days of summer vacation cutting that string off of the line. We tried to use a biodegradable line and we just couldn't find one that was small enough diameter and would have the uh, breaking strength that we needed to withstand the first couple of weeks before the hold fast migrates over to the, um, the long line. No, uh, to wrap the spools we took an old Singer sewing machine <laughs> and we broke it open and we put uh, one of our tie rods from our muscle raft on it. And we take, and uh, this gets put onto it, and then uh, we have a bobbin of, a big bobbin of line, and you just hit the foot pedal and you go down and it's just like <laughs> filling a fishing reel. When we started out, it was during the football games, right? Watching this, <laughs> talk about, that was mindless. And then we were like, there's gotta be a better way. So we have, the, we have the Singer sewing machine. If you want to see a picture of it, download our manual and you will see the Singer sewing machine that has saved countless hours of sitting on the couch. Uh, doing 30,000 feet would be a long time. We can do a spool in about a minute uh, with the Singer sewing machine and it takes two commercial breaks to do, with, uh, to do one uh, by hand. Uh, there's a company out in Washington State called Vital Choice uh, that sells our smoothie cubes and I think a company called Jackie's, yeah. But it's really, we're, we do so little, I mean, we might do, uh, you know, 500 smoothie cubes through retail a year, and we do, you know, 80 to 90,000 a month through institutions, so it's, it's just the scale is, is so different.